Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maura Keefe. I'm one of the scholars in residence here. The title of today's talk is Studio Theater at MoMA. And I'm going to give you just a brief description from the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, as we will probably all call it. Um, for this new installation in the Kravis studio, Eve Laris Cohen will repurpose the remains of the Doris Duke Theater, originally named the Studio Theater, which was destroyed in 2020 by a fire at Jacob's Pillow, a historic dance site in Be Beckett, Massachusetts. Let me introduce uh, the folks I'm sitting up here with and then tell you a little bit about how we're going to talk about this. Eve Laris Cohen creates installations and performances that challenge conventions of dance and visual art. His work uses elements of theatrical architecture, including uh, walls, curtains, rigging systems, and sprung floors, and considers the everyday later labor that goes into constructing, handling, and maintaining them. These materials change over time, whether from physical deterioration, active repair, or changing status from architecture into artwork and back again. Thank you, Momo, for writing those nice words to describe you. <laughs> Martha Joseph is the Phyllis Ann and Walter Borton Assistant Curator of Media and Performance in the Department of Perform Media and Performance at MoMA, uh, which we, as I said, we're going to keep calling MoMA. Prior to arriving there, she held positions at the Whitney Museum, where she assisted on the Biennial. And I like to just point out our neighbor up the road. She was also a curatorial fellow at Mass MoCA. And Norton Owen, director of preservation here at The Pillow, who was quoted in Dance Magazine this past spring as saying he has one eye looking backward and one eye on what's happening currently, and that will be particularly important to this conversation. And because I feel like it needs a bio of its own, as it was first known, the Studio Theater, later known as the Doris Duke Theater, opened in 1990. It was a more intimate and adaptable space than the Ted Sean Theater. During the festival season, the space shifted from proscenium seating to numerous variations of seating arrangements as imagined by choreographers. After the festival, it became a sleek dance studio that hosted artist residencies. The theater was consumed by a structural fire, as I said, in November 2020. Sarah Mearns, a principal dancer with New York City Ballet, wrote on an Instagram post the day of the fire that she could not imagine Jacob's Pillow without the Duke because her, her performance titled Beyond Ballet uh, was in the Duke, the final season. This place, she said, gave me permission to be whatever artist I wanted to be. Pillow director Pam Taji said in the New York Times interview later the day of the fire, it was just a pile of steel and wood, she said when she arrived here. There's amazingly one wall and one staircase that remained. And in that statement of what remained, one wall and one staircase, that begins our conversation today. I'm gonna to leave that as kind of a cliffhanger for a moment and ask you all uh, to, to talk more generally at first. But first I ought to say thanks for being here, everybody. It's so great to have you here. So we're at a dance festival. We have a theater, we have an outside stage, we have grounds that regularly host dance of all sorts, and audience members who are on the pillow grounds expect to see dance here. Museums are, are different. So I just want to start by thinking about this notion of putting performance in museums, uh, specifically dance. And Eve, I'm going to start with you. And before we talk about your work specifically, can you re recall moments of performance that you ever happened on as an audience member? I think the happening upon it is key because um, I think that's the expectation, or it used to be the, the expectation with um, performance in a, a visual art context, and specifically in an institution like a museum, is that it uh, should be already occurring and then you happen to um, uh, interrupt it or, or, or it interrupts your um, seamless uh, movement around the, the building as opposed to uh, you know, a seated audience with an announced start time. And so um, I'm interested in the, the introduction of those theatrical conventions into uh, visual art um, spaces and, um, and facility, or the same thing, but you know. Norton, how about you? Happen well, upon I, or seeing yeah, stuff? Yeah, I actually have a, a different, what springs to mind immediately when I hear that question is uh, a, a very powerful experience that I had at Tanglewood one time when I was wandering, not in the public areas, but really just wandering through the kind of woods, although, of course, you're not really in the woods there, but away from the performance area enjoying nature, and then suddenly I started hearing music coming from uh, a rehearsal studio. And 
it so took me by surprise. I hadn't expected to hear music in that setting while I was walking down this um, dirt road. And, and consequently, I heard it in a different way. So, I mean, I think that's what springs to mind when I think about how you, putting art in a different setting can make it a totally different experience for you somehow. So, so Martha, I want to turn it over to you because because uh, I think this is exactly where Eve is resisting uh, my question is is kind of what your job is. That it used to be that um, maybe if dance happened at all, it would be something that you would kind of round the corner, as you uh, pointed out. Um, but now, tell, tell us a little bit about the, um, uh, the Kravis uh, space. MoMA has a long history uh, with performance. In fact, it had a department of theater and dance um, at its founding back in the 30s. But um, the department of media and performance that I work in was founded more officially in the early 2000s. Um, first, it was the department of media, and then and performance art was added in 2009, around the time of the Marina Abramovich show in 2010. Um, but MoMA's renovation in 2019 was really a game changer for us because we built the Kravis Studio, which is now our flexible performance space um, within the collection galleries on the fourth floor. Often theaters and museums will be in the basement and be kind of siloed separate from the rest of the collection or the rest of the art that we show. And so that idea of the encounter that you don't quite expect, that somebody could be looking at a Warhol in an adjacent gallery and then walk into a different kind of space. Um, in this case, we have dark walls. It's a little bit of a hybrid black box. Um, and you can all of a sudden see a performing body. We have Okuyak Pakwasili in residence right now with some dancers. So you can literally walk into an open rehearsal. Um, and I think the sightedness for us in relation to the collection gave us an opportunity to make an argument for performance really being an important foundational part of art history. Eve has been here doing Pillow Lab residencies, which is kind of a uh, an opportunity for artists to dig into their creative research in various kinds of ways. And there's an outstanding conversation between Eve and Martha that really puts Eve's uh, work in, and it gives you a sense of the uh, scope of Eve's work. So I'm going to recommend that you all ch uh, check that out in the archives or look for an excerpt of it on YouTube. But there is this one moment I want to ask you about, because you guys have kind of this knowing, nodding look where you say, yeah, black box, white cube, gray space. Could you talk about like what, what was uh, embedded in that, no that, there it is, that's the knowing look right there. What, so tell us about, and you just said, it's a kind of a hybrid black box space. So tell us, tell us about how you are thinking about those terms. Well, I feel like um, in a number of recent museum expansions, there have been the additions of these performance spaces that are an attempt to more adequately make a home for living bodies within the museum and make a home for an art form that requires um, additional technical um, capabilities that the white cube, meaning the four white walls of a gallery that traditionally one might hang a painting on or show a sculpture within, don't have. We laughed at the term gray space. There were a number of um, articles written or terms circulating that would kind of get at the ability for a space to transform between um, a theatrical space. You were seeing people use that term as something that was kind of a hybrid and... and are and so, Eve, want to add anything to that uh, distinction between uh, the, the white cube and, and uh, black box from your perspective as an artist? I mean, I guess um, what I'm curious about is how everyone assumes that the, the meeting point between uh, white and black, white cube, black box as synecdoches for um, theatrical and and exhibition spaces, dance and visual art economies, the assumption is that that makes gray and that it's like a, a blending and that, and you said earlier, I think like intimate and adaptable um, and then later sleek and like those are all um, I'd say aspirational um, that's, those are the goals I guess of, of um, 
of uh, gray space? Uh, uh, yeah, of uh-huh. museums when they're building spaces for performance. And um, so I, I'm curious about that. I, I don't, uh, yeah. So I, I guess I'm going to ask this question, and I'm going to try talking loud in case the rain quiets down a little. Um, I think you're not that interested in, in the hybrid. And, and, for, and so maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, one of your works uh, called Embattled Garden, which I think really kind of resists those, uh, those three territories as um, something that can be hybridized into the gray space. So tell us about that project. Uh, that, pro- that project was um, in a commercial gallery, and at the time I had been working for the Martha Graham Dance Company as a, as a production assistant, and as part of my work, I would do everything from uh, drive dancers upstate for a rehearsal to um, moving their sets around uh, the storage facility, and this was in the years after Hurricane Sandy had completely decimated the Graham Company's entire archive, including uh, paper materials, costumes, and all of their original sets. And um, they were piecemeal trying to um, rebuild the, the, the Noguchi archive, ballet by ballet. And um, I offered to uh, Sorry, them... just to say, Isama Noguchi, uh, modern oh, yes. art sculpture, collaborated frequently with Graham, and they had many of these sets that were in regular performance, but also stored with the stuff that was destroyed. Yes, and, um, and often the originals um, were, were damaged. Um, what I learned is that Noguchi would often um, build, build a set for Graham, and the Graham company would take the original set, and then he would, within the same year, build a copy for his own museum. So when you go to the Noguchi Museum, you're, um, you're not looking at often the, the first um, or, or original, but um, those are actually in circulation and used and danced on and um, have wear and tear. Um, but, you know, Sandy being a, a different catastrophic kind of <laughs> wear and tear um, uh, a crisis. And, um, and so, yeah, I guess that's, that's the meeting point between these two institutions is uh, this sh- shared experience of unforeseen um, natural disaster that uh, really changes an institution's form. Um, oh, but but there's so you had um, n- there was nothing as part of your job that said do anything. Uh, part of your job as a production assistant for the Graham Company that said do anything with this set that was damaged. Well, no. So I asked them if I could rebuild a set for them um, and gift it to them. Um, and I, but I wanted to be on the clock with them as their production assistant. Um, so I, um, yeah, I wanted to be paid a production assistant's wage to do this like highly skilled artist's labor of, of making um, a, a Noguchi set. Um, and I did it inside the gallery. So um, someone, expecting to see a, a gallery show would happen upon <laughs> me, um, you know, using the gallery as a workshop and, and um, constructing the set. So what was it about um, seeing, and, and I'm saying this, and I, and I told Eve this before we started, that there's something that feels very connected to the work we're going to talk about, studio theater, in a few moments. Uh, what was it about seeing the... Um, the kind, the damaged set that was intriguing to you was it the, the 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 fact that the company needed it that that you could you could you know do something for a dance company and kind of tie it to your own laboring interests. What was it particularly about that? Yeah, I mean, well, part of it was just a, a really basic, pragmatic, like material need for the company that um, I I thought you know to um, kind of lay bare the, you know, intimate um, knowledge and handling of, um, of these, like, prize sets that the, the production assistants and technical staff have. But also, um, I was curious about uh, questions of legacy and, um, uh, you know, I would be participating and complicit in the um, helping this company keep going, like to to um, not just repair but build again from scratch because the sets were um, damaged beyond repair, and um, often dancers have to, you know, the, for a battle garden. I was building a, a a platform, like a raked 
a mini raked stage and then a, a 14 foot tall tree that the um, largest dancer the tallest in the company would have to cantilever off of. And so this is like high stakes stuff that you don't want to. Um, right, so it has to, it has to support the body. <laughs> yes, that it are, had to yeah, be yeah. functional and, and yeah, up to code and everything. So, so this, um, I think plays, lays the groundwork for my next questions, and I'm hoping that the three of you will agree to be self-centered in defining um, three terms, and those terms are uh, conservation, preservation, and archives. And so I think I'm thinking about, we're gonna start with sort of conservation, building from what you were just saying about the embattled garden set, that you, that you had this idea maybe about repair, maybe it was beyond repair, so, um, uh, and, if you don't want to go first, you can pass to somebody else. Conservation. I'm that's actually going to refuse to refuse? to answer that because that's like really at at the heart of this project, uh -huh. and and I have um, you know two casts of performers for the two performances titled Preservation and Conservation, who I'm kind of speaking through, and part of. Um, uh, what happens during the performance is like a kind of dissensus where these terms are contested and they um, are applied in different fields and um, yeah, the meanings vary uh, according to where you are in the world and are very cu culturally specific. So, um, you know, I, I will say that the I'm, I'm interested in the m multiple resonances within one word. So like, you know, conservation, for example, um, you know, being tied to well, so like environmental conservation and um, and that movement, and then the work of a, a, an art conservator or mm -hmm. restorer, mm -hmm. and then there's architectural conservation. So um, those disciplinary differences um, are of interest. Okay. Anybody else well, going to res? I can, as the director of preservation <laughs> here, um, I can certainly offer uh, what I see included in that because. One thing that I experience a lot when, when people first hear that my title is Director of Preservation, oftentimes one of the things they assume, they're like, oh, so you take care of the buildings. It's like, <laughs> mm, no, not so much. Um, although I do have a lot of input with, I mean, our, our buildings here, we do consider to be part of the pillow in a very um, integral way. So when changes are made in existing buildings, particularly the historic ones, oftentimes I am consulted about like, oh, do you think this color is okay? Or what do you think about doing this on siding? And I'm really glad to answer those kinds of questions. But I think of preservation in a larger context here because a lot of what we're preserving is also, well, certainly the, the traditional archival aspects of, of we're preserving documents and we're preserving photographs and we're preserving video. Um, but I think in a, in a broader sense than that, we are preserving the, uh, well, everything that Jacob's Pillow does, its relationship to its audiences, its, uh, its, um, its atmosphere, let's say, uh, the ambiance of the pillow. Um, so once you get through all those things, I have the biggest job in the world <laughs> because it's a lot of things to look after. But I, I will just say that I that we think about preservation as a as a very broad thing here. Martha, got going to weigh in on any of those terms? Well. Um, I'm loath to give any definitions, particularly as someone who works in a museum with a very strong conservation department, and I work very closely with that department. But one thing that interests me about Eve's work is the fact that a lot of the labor that he performs or the work that he performs as an artist often looks like something that somebody who is a conservator might do. Or So he's kind of... Um, playing with different ideas of, of care or work that's performed. For example, the sets that were reconstructed as a part of your Graham project. So I, I was um, did a, a, a little distracted dive into MoMA's archives to be looking at, so, so there was this 10-year moment of Lincoln Kirstein starting these archives at, at MoMA and wondering if, if that's ever kind of uh, bubbles up for you. Because one of the things that I feel here at The Pillow is that sometimes uh, as you can see in this exhibition, 
that 1937 feels like 2022. And um, I'm wondering if you've had that experience with the archives, which uh, one thing I read says that, that it's that the original order of the records made access difficult. For instance, according to an inventory found with the materials, this is at MoMA, not at the pillow, um, one would find complementary correspondence under P for pats on back. Uh, so, <laughs> which... <laughs> That seems logical to me. <laughs> so that's, that's from a very old kind of uh, conversation about the archives that was in there. So, I mean, do, does that, is that of interest to you as, uh, in your job as curator there to think about stuff that came before? I mean, uh, certainly I'm glad you mentioned Lincoln Kirstein because he's so crucial to MoMA's relationship to performance in many different forms. And I think it's important to say, too, in terms of our collection, um, performance is represented in many different ways. Of course, it's we have ephemera in the archives, we have actual performances in the collection to which we own the copyright for the choreography. Um, so for us, we're constantly thinking through, and it's a very case-by-case -case basis, dependent on the work and the artist, um, how we can participate in caring for the afterlife of a performance. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna get to the one one standing wall and uh, a staircase. So, Eve, tell us about first hearing about the fire at the Duke and what you thought, because as I understand it, you had never been to a performance in that theater. That's true, and I in fact never been to Jacob's Pillow mm -hmm. at all. Um, but so it was 2020, and I like many was at home. Well, I was teaching from from home, but had been really cooped up and um, I think uh, yeah like the experiencing it as like a very remote thing like um, was uh, I think how a, a lot regardless of how um, close you are to the the pillow I think it, that was how we all digested it um, and I wanted to come and see it because I I don't know I, it moved me I saw my you know many um, dancer and choreographer friends on social media posting about it, like that tweet you read, which I also saw and, um, at the time. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I drove up here to, to see what a, a, a theater that um, had been consumed by flames uh, looked like. Partly, too, also because, like, fire is, um, like... It's the, you know, cliche, like the greatest threat to the theater and the only time when free speech is re restricted and um, as far as not being able to say, yeah, fire in a theater. So, um, so it was like the worst thing that could possibly happen happened and in this year of already, um, you know, global crisis and, and illness and death. Uh, so... How, I mean, so you got here and you, and very quickly, right? Like, so you saw exactly what, what Pam Taji was talking about and the, the, um, the very brutal, there's a, a wonderful, wonderfully sad film um, that uh, was made on the grounds uh, not long after that uh, Eiko Otaki made that, that documents exactly what was left after the fire was out and the snow started to fall. So can you say something about, like, we know you have this interest um, from embattled garden and things that have been destroyed and thinking about kind of the, the future of them. Talk a little bit about the moment when you thought, okay, this isn't just a road trip to get out of the city to see something that feels tragic and important, but is maybe the seed of an idea for an artwork for you. I mean, right, I just had a hunch. It was just a, a gut feeling. Um, I, I wasn't going for, like, the spectacle. It was because, um, yeah, I felt like a, 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 a deep research curiosity and, um, and, yeah, that's what pulled me here, I guess. So I feel like you two might have had different reactions to uh, Eve's initial interest. Norton, I'm thinking perhaps you were excited and Martha, maybe you were a little bit scared. So I'm going to start with Norton. Oh, I was going to say the opposite. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was not scared. But, uh, but yes, excited because what I saw immediately was, and, and particularly because of all of the things that Eve was interested in seeing in our collection, which went way beyond just like, oh, do you have the original plans for the Duke? 
well, which we do, but uh, that would have been pretty boring in and of itself. Uh, yeah, uh, it goes... Oh, wait, back up a second. Say, yeah. Norton, what was the first conversation you and Eve had? Do you recall? Oh, him? Um, I think it was just that... Do it was you my, ever my site you? visit on December 9th, yeah, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it was just um, to... to uh, to, to come and see some stuff in the say, archives yeah, about the we, studio would, theater? Would we have things? Uh -huh. And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, and, and we have things that nobody else had ever asked to see. So that's always thrilling for uh, somebody in my position to, you know, you have your things tucked away. Do you think, is anybody ever going to care about this? And then suddenly somebody does. So you're thrilled that somebody wants to see these memos or, you know, uh, board minutes or videos of a meeting or other kinds of things that you think are really kind of boring. But in fact, when you have the kind of inquiry that Eve has and the interest that he has in the beginnings of the theater, then suddenly it's very important. And we're glad we had them. So, Martha, what's the conversation between the two of you about, hey, I've got this idea, and there's a big, a big burned out wall and staircase that's maybe of interest? Well, I received a text message <laughs> on a group text chain um, from Eve, uh, and We've been in conversation for many years now, uh, along with Stuart Comer, who is the chief curator of our department. And we've worked with Eve before and have long been interested in his work. But I could just sense in our early conversations, Eve, um, your excitement around this idea and this project. And I, like you, had a gut instinct that there was really something there, um, despite the logistical hurdle of many aspects of the process, including the salvage process, and also beginning a conversation with um, the institution Jacob's Pillow, which we have never collaborated before. Um, and I must say, I was pleasantly surprised um, at how open and collaborative uh, the pillow has been. So, I mean, really thank you to you, Norton, and to Pam, and to everyone who have been so wonderful. And uh, that really showed me given that you didn't have a pre-existing relationship with Eve, how seriously you take artists here at The Pillow, um, which makes for a fantastic collaborating institution. So I'm just going to say an aside here, there's going to be a series of performances as part of this exhibition, as Eve just said. So, But keep your eyes peeled on MoMA's website. It'll tell you the, the details of uh, the when, the where, and the whom, which I think we will not talk about. But we're more interested in the, the research process. And I'm thinking about some of those um, conversations. Because I've been thinking about Eve, you saying, I have an idea, I want to see this. And oftentimes when you start on a research project in archives, you don't even know what the next thing you're going to be interested in because you don't know what's even there. So can, can you think about sort of the initial things you were thinking you were interested in and, and then some discoveries that came out of... I, I feel like you're kind of duet with Norton in the archives. Yeah, it's, oh, in the archives specifically, because because um, the big focus b before I had you know research residency here that preceded the Pillow Lab was yeah the lo logistics of um, getting the materials off site and and storing them. But uh, I, oh, don't oh. don't just drop that and move on. Say a little bit more about that oh, before you oh, move on. Okay. I'll bring you back well, to the archives. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, well, first there there was. Um, uh, you know, an, an active investigation into the fire, and so um, everything had to stay in place for for many months. And so, um, by the time we could begin the work of, and then you know, budget questions too, and, you, and is this going to be a show, and where, and um, because that often needs to happen before the resources can be mobilized. Um, and and I was just like, I don't, I don't know, I don't care. We just need to like save it. I was concerned about um, rust and other like environmental hazards but you know to the to the materials but um interestingly like as i learned from um the conservators i've been speaking with um this the snow that that the for example the the um pipe 
pipe grid, um, uh, the technical grid, was submerged and um, helped prevent it from rusting. I didn't know that <laughs> it had to be kind of warm to, to rust. It was just like it's wet in there. Um, but that was actually, you know, it kind of preserved it for a little while. And then the, the, the wall's exterior was made to be out in the elements. Um, the sheetrock on the other side, not so much. But um, uh, so yeah, first was just, um, well, then digging the materials out of the snow, um, which I got a head start on um, by myself before um, the excavator came to demolish so, the entire. So your first thing was like, or, save everything? Was that your first kind of, or? I, I did ask that at one point, if we could like even save the foundation. Um, partly because, I mean, I, I was, uh, at, at one point, I was like, could I bring the entire theater into MoMA? Like, all of it, everything that was left. And then, as I was digging through the materials, um, I, um, well, at first, I, I wondered if, if the um, materials I'd previously worked with, like Sprung Floors and Marley and... Uh, in earlier projects. In right? earlier yeah. projects, yeah. And um, the soft goods, so, you know, drapes, curtains, and um, I, I wondered if those still remained. Um, the floor, I found just... a couple pieces of um of the this the uh sleepers underneath within the, the foam um um uh what is it called the neoprene pad or yeah i'm looking <laughs> at paul <laughs> um anyhow um and then uh so that that wasn't really an option i mean most of the wood was really totally gone except for that wall and then um so your first instinct was save everything and then you started oh, 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 to realize yeah. that some stuff was too far gone, or this was more interesting. Well, and we actually remember the risers. Like I saved the the audience risers too. At one point, they um, had formed a kind of like really <laughs> formally beautiful, like the way that they had been compressed because during the fire um, at one point they were moved out of the way once the so that the firefighters could get to the seat of the fire in the middle and um, when that happened they had like been frozen in this incredible shape and then we, we saved those and then later I decided to to not work them with them partly because I learned that they were not originally part right. of, of the design and, and came much later and um, then to your question about um, about working the archives with Norton, I mean, at first I, I really didn't even know, like the first research residency was really to just find out what my questions were. <laughs> and then the second research residency was to like ask them, I guess, or, or I was, and asking them in between too, but, um, I, I've realized that I'm, um, I mean, these questions about legacy that I was after in the Graham project um, are, are present here and um and also the question about like um institutional priorities what did that particular space signal like what kind of um dance was it for was it a studio or was it a theater and what is the difference um i during at your pillow talk last year or when you moderated um build me a theater mm -hmm. that i watched um online um the at one point Vinny uh, vigilante who's what's his production manager uh, director of technical, director production, of technical production here at the pillow yeah yes he said that um he, he he called it a studio, the Doris Duke, and and not a theater. And he and the reason why he said it was a studio in his mind was because um, it the um, the roof and um, the rafters couldn't support enough weight. And that was really interesting to me that the capacity to bear weight is what made something a theater or not. And that's a question I'm asking in in MoMA's space, which is interestingly called the studio. Um, you know, is it, um, can, it, and it is actually struggling to bear the weight of the this studio this theater. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, yeah. The, no, I mean, physically, the the remains of, of the Duke. And so um, I think we really pushed it to its limit. Um, do you want to Go say ahead, more Martha. about that? Well, do you want to describe a little, do you want to describe what that means in the context of the installation? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, do we have to They're desperate. The secret, secret They're desperate. I, I think <laughs> we should share a little bit more yeah, about what you'll fine. see <laughs> when you come to MoMA in the fall, which I hope all of you will do. Yeah. When, uh, what's the date of this? It opens October 8th, and it's on view until January 1st. 
So what will we see? Should I just say? We're not going to talk about the performance. Just like <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm 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 hanging. I've reconstituted the the um, pipe grid of. Um, which is uh, where the, the instruments, the lights, the, a projector, anything like that, something that might drop, what, so the stuff that you never look at. If you're an audience member, you're not looking. Unlike the embattled garden where people would have paid attention to the sets, lots of people would never have paid attention to the grid right. in the Duke. And, um, and I've rebuilt it according to the um, uh, dimensions of MoMA's um, wire rope tension grid, which is has performs a similar function as a pipe grid, um, but uh, you can walk on top of it. It has um, certain advantages and disadvantages um, by comparison. So a grid is supporting a grid. Um, and, uh, and what else should I say on that point? <laughs> and then there's also the wall. Um, right, and 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 then I um, s saved that one wall that um, that Pam mentioned. And, and the fire saved you that wall. The, right? the, the yeah. staircase no longer yeah. exists, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So um, Martha, tell us a little bit about um, the text chain you were getting. I, I I found this cool thing in the archives today, or I have this idea about something because you weren't always here for all of the residency, right? So were you starting to be able to picture? Um, what Eve was imagining from the things that were sparking his interest in the conversations he was having with Norton? Great question. Um, yeah, we have to find a way for the text chain to go into the archive someday. <laughs> we definitely stayed in close conversation as your um, conversations with Norton developed during the research residency and then um, also, when we were on site here for the pillow residency, I was present for that, um, and that really helped me get a sense of what the performance aspect might look like. Um, but there was another work that you had made before that I always kind of had in the back of my mind when we were talking about this, which was your exhibition um, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego in 2018 called Meeting Ground that involved bringing some architectural elements from a decommissioned um, theater, Sherwood Hall, into a white, in that case, a white cube gallery. And I could tell from our conversations the way in which you were thinking about bringing architectural structures into a museum was developing in new ways. And so I think between that and then between checking in while you were up here and hearing how all of your great resources, Norton, were contributing to Eve's um, thoughts, I was able to get a clear sense. But of course, you know, when you commission something, you're signing on to a vision that is incomplete in a way. The in-process part, yes. yeah. So one of the things I've been thinking about is we've been talking about material objects and um, your background is not just in the materiality of things, but is also in the action of dance. And so I've been thinking about, um, and, with, with, and I'm not, saying show us some cool moves here, but I'm thinking about like what are things that um, that you found in the archives that felt like maybe that felt action oriented because we we aren't talking about the performances that took place in the Duke. We're talking about yeah. we're talking about the structure of the building more than anything else. So so uh, maybe you could just say something about that. Um, action oriented. Yeah. Um, well, one thing was um, Norton had, I think prior to my first visit here, found um, evidence that my, <laughs> evidence, but um, uh, that my ballet teacher from my youth um, had been here in 1964. Yeah, this is Sonia Arava. Yes. And um, yeah, there was a wonderful, I mean, one of the things that we always do is try to find connections between uh, researchers and what, uh, what they know or want to know in some ways. And, and you never know where those connections are going to come or where they're going to lead. So one of the things that I really enjoyed talking with Eve about, because I got to say, not a lot of people come in and say, what do you have about Sonia Arava? Um, you know, she was very famous at, in, at her time, uh, in her time of performance, but that was in the 60s. So that was 50 years ago at this point, 60 years ago. And um, 
And so for somebody to express interest in her, it's like, oh yeah, we have, th we have films, we have photographs, we have programs, and here they are. And so, well, one, yeah. one of the most touching materials about Sonia was actually in um, Ted Sean's, and uh, was it correspondence to Barton or was it in the newsletter? It was Probably in the newsletter. his newsletter, as was I would it? imagine. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, it felt like he was writing. Well, those to newsletters were very personal. That's true, that's times. true. Yeah. But yeah, he um, told a whole story about, about Sonia and how she, um, you know, filled, was it, she filled in for someone who was injured or something. Somehow she, she had to. She saved the day when, there was, a, when there was an injury yeah. and, or a cancellation. And, you know, so these are, you know, these kinds of things are oftentimes off the grid in terms of uh, the official uh, history of things. But Ted Sean wrote an annual newsletter that was oftentimes 20 pages, typewritten, single-spaced. So uh, a lot of information in there, and a lot of it anecdotal and very personal, as Eve says. And to be able to, you know, Sonia Arava died a number of years ago, so to be able to reconnect him with someone who was a mentor to him um, in this unexpected place, that's one of the things that we love to do, you know, find, finding those kinds of connections. So, so I'm interested in, in that as, um, because Eve, that was your sort of, your dance connection to, or your dance legacy to, um, to the pillow was through, through your teacher who had been here, who was a part of the pillow history. Even, so it's like sort of your path into the, the pillow's dancing history. Then you've got this architectural interest. So could you say something about, uh, I mean, one of the things that I think a lot about the Duke is the, uh, the, happy memory ghosts that I have in that part of the campus that I saw a really lot of performances there and so those feel very present for me. But that, that's different for you. You're thinking about the space and, and not so much the lived experience of being there. But does that still resonate for you in this work? The, it's sort of history as a place of performance? Yeah, I mean, well, as far as like defining the scope of, of my project and the performances, it was a, a tough decision, but I, I, yeah, did decide to focus on um, the, the moments leading up to the building of the theater. And so it was, it's like the, um, the or studio theater, and the, the promise of it, um, and the vision for it. And um, I, I mean, I did watch, you know, I watched um, the Ralph Lemon and B.B. Miller's um, first um, kind of informal showing in 1989 before um, the Duke officially opened in 1990, and uh, a number of other things. I wasn't, you know, I didn't exclude that from my research process, but um, but I, I decided to leave that out, partly too because of how I've come to know the pillow in such a almost like inside out or outside in backwards way of you know through through board minutes like through its administrative details and um, and then finally leading up to seeing performances now because with 2020 and 2021 um, the festival is very different or it didn't exist and so so the kind of limitations that you put on your research after you got your questions to deepen in and uh, your interest uh, focused more is the moment before and a little bit the moment after. In the, yes, in the aftermath of, of, of the fire, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna open it up for your questions, which I'm gonna repeat. This, this is a question about, uh, about the fire itself, so Norton, I'm gonna turn it over to you to say something about, maybe first about uh, the what what we know about the fire and then maybe you will also because this feels like the companion question say something about the future uh, of, of the theater sure well you know one still one of the most common questions that we get is what caused it and um it is officially you know, it's not just me saying this but officially after a very exhaustive um investigation it is officially undetermined they could not find the source of it. Um, speculation that it would be some kind of electrical fire or something like that. Um, it certainly, no one, even though they, they looked at every possibility, but uh, it certainly was, was not found to be arson or anything uh, problematic, let's say, uh, like that. So, 
so it was an accidental fire and the timing of it uh, and, and I will go on from that only to say that there were multiple system failures in addition to the actual fire. So uh, there were things about our fire suppression system that were not, even though it had been um, uh, inspected? Investi inspected, thank you, uh, that, that um, things didn't work as they should have. And the timing was really unfortunate because if something like this had happened during the day when we were all here working, we would have seen it uh, uh, immediately. But it happened in pre-dawn hours when nobody was and, and the week of Thanksgiving, so already down. Well, to we over, were yeah. we were here, um, but uh, but not at five o'clock in the morning. Um, so there was that. But going on to the second part of your question. Um, which I believe is about replacing it. And, and that is very much our desire to replace it, although not to replace it with a carbon copy of what was here. So uh, we are doing the investigation at this part, at this point into what will come next. Um, we've been, we've done an exhaustive kind of uh, series of conversations with artists and with audiences and with constituents of all kinds to understand what it is that people want in a new theater and what they also what they valued in the theater that we lost so that we're not simply starting over from scratch but learning from that structure and being able to build something that will be uh, a 2.0 version of what was there before. So uh, we're in that journey now, and that is a multi-year journey that will take us time and money. <laughs> Patsy, you have a question? This is a question about, um, people come to the archives all the time at Jacob's Pillow, sometimes to look for the personal connection. I, I was here in 1973, do you have a record of it? Sometimes it's because they want to know the performance history. What is less common is that people would uh, be digging into things that maybe once were confidential, board, board minutes from, um, fr from a, a recent conversation or something, that those would have not been kind of the public side of what we think of the pillow. And so this question is about, Yay for digging into the archives, but Norton, did you have uh, any moments of, uh oh, this wasn't really meant for public consumption, and that Eve was really interested in, in not the history of 30 years of performance in the theater, but really more about the conversation of, of the building of it? Well, I will say that we really didn't ever have any um, conflict over that. Um, I always felt um, that that Eve was very respectful about the materials that I showed to him. I mean, sometimes there are things that are surprising, yes, and things that, that uh, you don't expect necessarily to find in terms of a conversation that took place at a board meeting at a certain point in time or, or, or a piece of correspondence that reveals something that people were interested in uh, decades ago. But none of that I, di I didn't feel that any of it was so sensational that it had to be suppressed. Uh, I was not worried about Eve being in cahoots with the National Enquirer and that we would soon be the subject of tabloid, uh, you know, supermarket tabloids. Um, maybe that will still happen this fall, I don't know, but uh, if so, that will only drive more people to MoMA. So, so, so Eve, fun. were there things you were well, sort of reluctant to ask for because you, you wondered about that sort of, that the kind of tension that, that uh, Patsy was positing might have happened, that you maybe didn't want to ask for financial records or something? Oh, I, I'm not shy to ask for, for <laughs> that or anything. But, Definitely but, not. But, but there was a, a moment, with, can I talk about the attic? Sure, sure. Well, so oh, yeah. at first, when, when um, I w was um, curious about this design competition that had happened in 1984 that um, eventually led to this selection of um, an architect who would actually not be the architect of record, but created a, a preliminary design for the, the Doris Duke. Um, but in the design competition had a, a lot of... Um, uh, uh, how large were they? Uh, oh, original, big. like, yeah. I mean, yeah, like huge. they were like four by eight 
uh, sheets drawings. of, uh, yeah, drawings. Uh, yeah. Four, four by eight feet. Let's yeah. Say. yeah. Wait, four by eight feet? They were not like a sheet of plywood, but... Yeah, they were that. Well, maybe okay. four by six. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll go with four by okay, six. Okay, but but they but um, Norton was saying, oh, I think they're in the the Hunter House attic, but I'm not sure where. And which is the administration building and the original farmhouse building oh, that yes, touched on. Yep. Yes, okay. and and he said, I'm not sure if it would be germane to to go up there. And so for our first visit, um, we didn't. And then um, it, it was not until the residency, kind of pretty late when when Norton was like, okay, I decided to go up in the attic just to see, and, and finally he found them, and then um, uh, he let me go up with him well, later. I did more than let him go up, <laughs> because these things are, they, they were big and unwieldy, and so I needed Eve's help in getting them out. Oh, you know, the life of an archivist, yeah, I tell ya, you know, we're not just shuffling vapors, we're going through these huge things in, in the dusty attic and uh, so yeah when when things when they talk about archivists unearthing things this is <laughs> this was a good example of unearthing for sure so then i'm going to say uh, in summary plan on going to the museum of modern art in the fall starting october 8th and you got to go this fall cuz it'll be closed by 2023 and then come to the pillow and ask Norton for all the weird stuff that's in the attic or in the basement. Thanks, Mara. <laughs> because uh, there's wonderful treasures. And I'm going to also say, please, if you um, have a question about something that you didn't want to ask uh, out loud, please stroll up and talk to any of one of these fabulous people. We look forward to seeing your work in New York. Thanks for being here today. Thanks to both of you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.